Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, intriguing ideas, and lessons learned over time. Let's jump in. As a child, Tampa, Florida teen Jasmine Mazard Larry was challenged by ADHD and hearing loss. If these challenges weren't enough, Jasmine's life was tragically affected by a fire that destroyed her family's home. Almost killing her father and her very pregnant mother, the fire left Jasmine and her family homeless for the first two years that Jasmine was in high school. Last month, Jasmine graduated from Dr. Kieran C. Patel High School with an 8.07 grade point average by taking part in dual enrollment in advanced placement classes and the Cambridge Advanced International Certificate of Education program. Jasmine received her high school diploma and an associate's degree from a local community college. She earned the great honor of serving as the valedictorian for her graduating class. Her plans? To go to college and become a doctor. Reflecting on her experiences, Jasmine says, They're not setbacks, she said. They allowed me to be who I am today. She points out, We all have our own story. There's the good and the bad, but don't overlook the bad because it makes you who you are. In 20 or 10 years from now, you're going to look back and be like, I did that. I conquered all of these obstacles, and here I am today. What an inspiring young person. Mm hmm. A real feel-good story there. Isn't it? Yeah. I know change and life transitions are a natural part of being human and allow for personal growth, but that was a really difficult change of circumstance for Jasmine. Personally, I don't feel that I... (laughs) I'm so good with change. No, a a creature of habit, are we, Walker? I wouldn't say that exactly. I'm okay to try new restaurants, switch up the paint colors in the house, and you know, my own hair. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the big changes, the big transitions, they make me nervous. Yeah, It's the unknown, the uncertainty, even if there is potential for good to come from the experience. Yeah, change is hard, particularly when it's unexpected. Yeah, I always get on with it, you know, when change comes my way, as we all do. But I certainly don't embrace change like some people. You know the type there, the ones who love to dive headfirst into the unknown. Mm-hmm. Did you know there's actually a difference between change and transition? I think I did, but I'm not sure I could describe the difference. Okay. Well, according to the University of Victoria Center for Excellence in Learning, change is the shift in the external situation, the thing that has changed. It can happen fast. Right. Transition is the reorientation that people need to make in response to the change. And that can take time. Okay, that makes sense. Transition is the tough bit. Yeah, yeah. According to Florida-based South Cove Counseling, transitions tend to be difficult for us because we're resistant to that external change, whatever it might be. It's more comfortable to live the life we know than living one that has unknowns and uncertainties. So much so that they say, even if we're not entirely happy with our current lives, it sometimes feels better to stick with what we know than to take the leap into something new. Okay, so I'm not alone in this one. Definitely (laughs) not alone in this one. It seems like a pretty common human experience. So what would you say have been some of the hardest transitions that you've experienced? Well, I've lived a while, Walker, so I've Mm. had a few. One adult experience that stands out, though, was the birth of my firstborn son. It was very traumatic. He was born just a few days before 9-11, which was a a global trauma. Uh, But he almost didn't survive his birth, and he was in the NICU for weeks, and that was followed by years of occupational and physical therapy. And on that day, my whole vision as a mother was transformed into something completely foreign and, and unknown, and we had to adapt. It was a long and difficult road, now having to identify as a parent of a child with a disability. Wow, life changing. Yeah, it was life-changing. So what about you? Um, I would say that two major transitions in my life involved moving cities to start graduate work. One of those times I relocated happened to be in a period of my life that was already upside down. I just found out my father was dying of cancer many, many years too young. Mm -hmm. And I ended a relationship shortly after relocating and to start, you know, this intensive doctoral program. It all was happening 
at once. Yeah, that's the definition of stressful. Yeah, it was. And as a result, I developed alopecia areata where my hair was falling out, leaving huge bald patches. Mm -hmm. And I developed rheumatoid arthritis, you know, an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So the stress was manifesting in me physically. Yeah. Well, hair loss and other physical symptoms are not uncommon with severe stress. Although we experience change throughout our life, there are significant transitions that everybody endures as they move from youth to adulthood, like starting kindergarten or daycare. Right. It's often the first real separation from your parent. Mm-hmm. My oldest cried for two months, oh my Walker. Gosh, two months. Two <laughs> Oh. months. Yeah. Or, you know, what about the day we graduate from high school? I remember that day. I was really excited, but I was also petrified about what was coming next. Right. What's next? Yeah. Anytime something ends and we start something new, we can expect to experience stress, even if it's good stress. Yes. But I think today's young people are facing different and maybe even more uncertainty than we did. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking particularly of climate change, inflation, lack of employment, just to name a few. Yeah. Moreover, they're just finding their footing after emerging from a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. Social circles are still being reestablished, and some families, some of which are fragmented now, are still trying to get back to where they were pre-pandemic. Yeah, it's pretty uncharted territory, isn't it? It sure is. A lot of kink still to be worked out for most of us. Yeah, yeah. I think I was much more oblivious to uncertainty when I was young than today's younger generations. For sure. We weren't bombarded 24-7 with up-to-the-minute opinions and news. It's also much harder to discern what is fact and what is not these days. Like that recent viral post about an Amazonian snake cat. (laughs) Have you seen that, Walker? No. (laughs) What on earth is that? (laughs) It's totally ridiculous, but a lot of people have fallen for it. And it's that kind of misinformation that makes raising kids and growing up a little more complex than perhaps it was before. Right. But check this out. A 2017 report by the Institute for the Future stated that 85% of the jobs in 2030 have not even been invented yet. Wow. That's actually kind of exciting. I believe it. Yeah. Everything seems to be speeding up. Change seems to be happening daily. It does, doesn't it? How the heck do you guide young people into adulthood? Tell me this. When you don't even know what the future is going to look like. I know, right? It's tricky. It's hard enough that it's already a time when youth are being exposed to new and novel experiences, and they're expected to take on more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. For some kids, when they go to college and university, they're on their own for the very first time. So cooking and cleaning and managing their money, that might all be brand new to them. Right. And even though our teens heading off to college are young adults, or nearly so, most don't necessarily feel like adults. Right, absolutely. You know, it's surprising how so many of us tend to feel younger than we are. Yeah. Even later in life with all our aches and pains, inside we feel quite youthful. Absolutely. <laughs> totally true. I'm about 28 years old, I think, in, in my mind, but my husband, he's about four. Oh my God, hilarious. I knew <laughs> you were going to say that. <laughs> My kids would say it too. (laughs) So not only do these kids need to develop new skills, parent expectations can be pretty intense too. They can be. It really is a lot of pressure. Going off to school is expensive. Mm. Kids are taking on massive loans for post-secondary education, and that in and of itself is terrifying. And of course, a lot of young people document their so-called seamless, happy transitions Mm. on social media, which just increases the pressure. Yeah, it's just not healthy. It's not. It can be really anxious and insecure time. Kids are wondering, will they be lonely? Are they going to make new friends? Will they be able to find their classes? That was a big one for me. And keep up with all the work. Are they going to fail? Are they going to drop out? Yeah, that all sounds pretty familiar. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness we have the good guidance of today's guest. New York Times bestselling author, journalist, and speaker, Harlan Cohen. Harlan is a familiar face on high school and college campuses, having addressed audiences at over 500 schools and universities. Often referred to as America's top college life expert, I would argue that he is the top college life expert in the world. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Harlan. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Harlan, I've become a huge fan of yours after accidentally stumbling across your Instagram page a couple of years ago. As you know, the transition to college and university can be a challenging time for students. And you provide young people who are experiencing this transition to independence really insightful advice. Can you tell our listeners how you came to be the leading expert in the field? You know, I was just good at being miserable. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, got, I got I got great at it, and uh, at least the first year in college. the The short story is I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, it was a really hard year for me. I didn't know how to make friends. I didn't know how to really find my places after a difficult four years in high school. Like, you know, it was rough freshman year. It was, it was, it was such a challenging time for me. Change has been hard for me over the years. And I didn't recognize that change is hard. You know, no one tells us change is difficult. And growing up in a community where I was, you know, I, I dealt with my own teen angst and issues. And I was able to work through that in high school. But when I got to college, people didn't know me. I had no community. Uh, I'm not an athlete, although I've become much more athletic now. I feel very fit, which is great. Um, But I didn't have a team sport to connect Mm -hmm. with. So really, like, how did I manage? And basically, it was a very difficult transition. And I then transferred from UW-Madison to Indiana University. And it was at Indiana University. It was still hard. But as an advice columnist, I eventually started writing an advice column. And I'm kind of paring everything down from you know a five or seven year journey. I learned that I wasn't alone. And that when it comes to transition and change, we don't teach people. We don't teach students high school and in university, it's mostly about grades, mm-hmm. getting the best grades so you can be the best so that the best will want you. And we miss out on a huge area that I've been focused on for over 20 years. There, there isn't a lot of education when it comes to the social and emotional transition and the life skills that we need in order to thrive. And everybody thinks they're alone going through this, suffering yeah. silently. Yeah, I think that's, you know, there's so many different stories and perspectives. You know, I'm a white male who has a lot of privilege, and I'm very lucky that I come from a family where I had the resources to to have this experience. And I mention this because I work a lot with first-generation students, um, the first ones in their family to go to college. I work with lots of students from lots of different backgrounds and cultures. And what I realized is, it doesn't matter where we come from. So many of us feel like we're alone. And in fact, because I had these resources and my parents went to college and my brothers went to college, I had such enormous shame. You know, I suffered in such silence because I was afforded all of these wonderful opportunities. And I felt like such a tremendous loser and failure because I was given so much, but I was just not able to do it. Like, what is wrong with, there should be nothing wrong with me. And and I see there's there's so many different stories, and I'm not looking for sympathy by sharing it. What yeah. I what what I love doing is, you know, connecting the universal message of transition and change, and just helping people to recognize life's uncomfortable, no matter who we are and where we're from, and that's what connects us if we allow it to. Right. Well, I know that I would have personally benefited from your guidance back in university. I was in university a long time and there were a lot of ups and downs. Your ability to connect with young people, though, I know your university experience was a bumpy one in the beginning, but to have that experience and then all of a sudden you're an advice columnist, (laughs) you know, that's a bit of a leap. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a weird path, but, um, I'd say if, if we were to zoom out and, and have it not just be university, but just life, the thing that's helped me to really be, um, you know, I hate even to use the word successful because what is success? The thing that's allowed me mm. to connect is I'm great at rejection. You know, I get rejected every day. Um, even this weekend, I got rejected. I posted a video about being a father and my kids were like, no, that's, they rejected my message on being a father talking about being imperfect. And my wife said, <laughs> You should take it down. Your hair's so messy, and like the back, of your hair's spiked <laughs> up, and and you know, I'm I like, actually oh. found that really refreshing, actually, to see. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I look like I just rolled out of bed and was taking the dog for a walk, and you know, she's she was being silly. Like we've 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 gotten used to the fact that you know I'm gonna I'm gonna look imperfect and and all yeah. of that. But rejection, it's rejection is something we really struggle with. So as a adult you know man with kids it i if i talk about rejection like when i was in middle school and and i liked this girl and and i liked i liked her because i met her at orientation i i sat behind her and and her hair smelled really good in like sixth (laughs) grade i was like oh i like her 
And then it took me a year and a half to get the courage to talk to her, but it was actually David who talked to her for me and told her I liked her. And she cried that day. Um, and I don't know why she cried, but it's like <laughs> that story, yeah, that's a real story. And, I shouldn't be laughing, but oh, it's it's like, you know, but I mean it is, it's so cute and so innocent. Yeah, that's and it. it's 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 rejection and fear and and, and all we've of all these, been there. Yeah, and so many of us are still there in some aspect yeah. of our life. And I think the the benefit of being an adult is you just create more walls and are able to disguise so many of your fears. And when those issues pop up, so many of us still aren't equipped to handle it. So yeah. whether we're a grade schooler or somebody who's you know deep into their life, there is still this very strange and sometimes unhealthy relationship with rejection. Right. One thing I love that you said, Harlan, recently in one of your posts is that if you're not experiencing rejection, then you're not taking enough risks. Yes. Right. I love that. It just normalizes it. It makes it something that you almost want. If you why because I'll do events and I'll be talking to students and I'll say, you know, who got rejected recently? And 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 people don't raise their hand and or I'll say, text me when you got rejected so you don't even have to talk. So it could be totally safe. And the thing is, if you don't have a good rejection story from the past month or two months, then you're not reaching high enough, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. you are not reaching. I think I've just become accustomed to being rejected in my social life and in my romantic life and family life and professional life. And it still hurts, but what I've been able to do is, is come up with these systems. I have a book called Win or Learn. The Naked Truth About Turning Every Rejection into Your Ultimate Success. And I love this book because it really provides a framework to approach life through this lens of what do I want? What excites me? What do I want to create change or experience? And what really scares me? What's standing in my way? And then being able to work with that with an understanding. and, uh, And I love sharing the universal rejection truth, this law of nature. That says no matter who we are, no matter how much or how little or how we look or our background, or race, religion, whatever it is, we will all encounter rejection. There's a law of nature that says not everyone and everything will always respond to me the way I always want. The law of nature, the universal rejection truth. And when we deny this truth, we end up hating ourselves, hating other people, feeling enormous shame. It is, it is the shame factory. It's the fuel for the shame factory that then manifests in all these different behaviors. But we can link it back to, if I can look in the mirror and I can give myself permission to be imperfect and I can give others permission to be who they are and not require anyone or anything to respond any other way than the way they're going to respond, then I'm going to live in a, in a much more balanced, healthy world because rejection is not my enemy. Well, having said all this, I'm glad you didn't reject us when when we reached out to you for this interview. (laughs) I'm happy to do it. I I really, you know, I I just, I love sharing and connecting. And and, uh, one one of my biggest, I I don't want to say flaw, but something I'm really working to improve is community and relationships. Because I'm really, I'm really siloed a lot of times. And and as a result of COVID and Mm -hmm. just not doing as much interacting. I'm an easy get because if I have time, I just want to offer and share and connect. Well, perfect. That's working out for us just nicely today. So speaking of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, certainly we haven't had a deficit of that in the last few years. I'm really curious if you've noticed any differences or any changes in the questions that you're receiving from youth as we've moved through the pandemic and beyond. Yeah. I know you also do a lot of work with, with young people. Have you, have you noticed anything? Well, I think in general, we have a lot, we have a lot of children between the two of us. And so certainly we've seen a lot of social isolation, social insecurity, not Mm -hmm. really knowing how to navigate new situations. And we both have had kids start university and college during the pandemic and just, just post pandemic. And I have one who started prior to the pandemic, and I think he had a much more natural, fluid, easier time 
because there were no restrictions and he didn't have that gap in just socialization in general. I would say a huge increase in, in anxiety yeah. as well. I mean, there was yeah. enough anxiety always going to university, um, but making that transition now and maybe in the age of so much technology, you know, kids don't need to go out to eat. They can get Uber Eats to come in now. Mm. They can just text. They Nobody has to really go out for anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I I love hearing your insight as well. It's it's been a lot of that social anxiety. I mean, there's there's just there's just so much of it, and I think that's even more prevalent than the the fear of the academic. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's the most it's 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 the most sensitive issue. Uh, how do I make friends? How do I find connection? How do I talk to people who are in positions of authority? How do I advocate yes. for myself? You know, one of the videos that on my social media. Uh, originally on TikTok, this one is over 20 million views on advocating for yourself. You know, if a teacher says, if I do this for you, I have to do it for everyone else. You know, how do you respond to something mm-hmm. like that? And it really, it really touched a nerve because I think saying what we think and expressing how we feel and dealing with authority figures who don't give us what we want, we missed out on a lot of those experiences. Our, our kids missed out on a lot of this because they weren't in those social situations where they yeah. had to advocate and dealt with difficult authority figures and there was a lot of leniency and and uh the the boundaries and rules were really bending so yeah. in terms of having that practice i've seen that being a big issue and you know one of the things i like to i like to help students with is really having a transition plan and 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 i've been really narrowing in for this particular season i have a a mental health transition plan that i've been oh. developing and as part of my podcast i launched a, a new podcast recently got wonderful guests that really support this idea of having a mental health transition plan, which consists of what do you want? Like, let's just start with what do you want? Like, what do you want this university experience to be? Like, Mm -hmm. But if we were to pinpoint and tell the story of our first year at university, I experienced something specific, like what is it? Whether I made friends or whether I got a certain grade point average, whatever it is, and then what stands in my way? And then who are the people who can help me on campus? Where are the places I could find connection, community, and support? How long will it take for me to get the answers I need? And then being supported and having a parent or family or whoever it is who understands what your plan is. And Mm -hmm. you have resources in place before problems even come up. Right. Right. It's a roadmap. Right. That they don't have. It's an exceptional tool, really. I've been working more with schools and with different programs, some grant-based programs to really help students and to help parents and families to just ask that question of what do you want and, and how can you put together that plan mm-hmm. using the the resources and the videos that I do every day and the different, I have a program called Best First Year, which is an online program. You know, it's all reinforcing this bigger message of answering the question, how can I go after what I want and be okay no matter what? Yeah. And be okay no matter what, because life is no matter what. It's all the no matter yeah. what's that you don't necessarily expect. And and they haven't had a lot of practice sometimes with these more uncomfortable situations. Absolutely. So clearly, you know, with, with these kinds of messages, you're striking a nerve with these children who are moving on, moving into adulthood, transitioning into college and university and community college too, which is a fabulous option for kids. And coming from parents, I mean, we've all been through it too, for the most part, it can sometimes fall on deaf ears. So what do you think makes you stand out? Is it just coming from a different source that that helps them hear it? Yeah. Or is it your personal experience maybe? Well, I love I love the question because you know, my kids, they start to listen to my like they'll watch my videos, but they still watch it and they'll listen to it as a kid. You know, it's yeah. like they're they're not looking, they don't want to like what I'm saying. You know, they're looking right. to get apart and and uh it's it's just funny because their friends will be like, Hey, you're you know, I really liked what your dad had to say. And they're like, really? Um, So I think there's just something in our tone as parents Mm -hmm. that when we talk, there is a off switch. You know, like, I just think it's like, unless there's something very heightened or our kids want something or need something and they need to listen in order to get somewhere or to get something, I think sometimes it just 
it just blends into the background. It's like the Charlie Brown teacher. And it really yeah. is that. So mm-hmm. what I'm able to do is repeat all the things that so many parents are sharing. You know, I get to share your wisdom, the thing that you've already said, and I get to say it. And because I have a different frequency and, and, and energy, all of a sudden it becomes this brilliant thought when, you know, it's it's really <laughs> not that earth shattering. I'm sure you have a lot of parents like Lauren and myself following you and going, did you hear what Harlan said yesterday? Right. It's so cool. <laughs> that's been a weird thing that's happened is it's exciting that all these parents, you know, they share this with their kids and their kids don't mind. Like that's the thing. Yeah. Their kids aren't annoyed. They actually find it helpful. And then I've got teenagers and 20 somethings and people in all, you know, all different ages who appreciate it. So, you know, one thing I ask for anyone listening is direct message me the things that you need to tell your kids, like the things you've been telling them. And I can tell them again, like if they're dating a rotten person, Mm -hmm. I can can tell them that they're dating a rotten person and you can share the message. Like, you know, I'm going to do a video of if somebody is aggressive towards other people or aggressive near you or around you, like that is a red flag. Like you should not. And if you have to keep secrets about your significant other's behavior, yeah. Right. Red yeah. flag, mm-hmm. red flag, because no one teaches us how to navigate relationships as well. So exactly. And just bringing that up alone in relationships, you know, it's not something that you necessarily think about sharing with your kids as they go navigate love and and relationships the first go around. And these things can can happen in secret. Like Lauren was saying before, it's, you know, these things can happen without eyes on from the parents. So to have that message out there, I think that's uh, incredibly valuable. You know, I am, I I am so open to information and the issues that your families are dealing with that, that you're both dealing with and people can share this privately, but like that really helps me to be able to then share information mm-hmm. and content and resources right. you know, mm-hmm. because I, I I really do want to help. It's a mission aligned with what you all want and what your listeners want. Well, and it's, and it's very obvious and you do have this gift of voice that people uh, and especially our young people that they really resonate with. So I do encourage our listeners to to DM you with whatever their ideas and watch out Harlan, because you've got some coming from me <laughs> Shortly. after our, after our interview today, you might have a whole long laundry list. I'm going to have to cut mine down to a short list. <laughs> no one will ever know. Right. So you've written seven books, I think, including your New York times bestseller, the naked roommate and 107 other issues you might run into in college which is actually required reading in many high school and college classrooms, which is amazing. So where on earth did you come up with that title, Harlan? And do I really want to know? <laughs> yeah, the the original title of the book was 100 Students, 100 Campuses, 100 Tips. Okay. So that doesn't really resonate. Okay. <laughs> wasn't the catchy title you wanted. No, that was what I submitted my pub- to my publisher. That was the title. That would be cool. Okay. That, like, you know, it really tells a story. And they're like, yeah, you know, we really don't feel like that resonates. So I played the guitar. I still play the guitar a little bit, not as much, but I used to play it as part of my live events. And uh, there's a song that I wrote called My Roommate Stew. And it's about a nudist roommate. It's actually on on um, it's on Spotify. It's oh it's, my gosh. Uh, you know, it's everywhere. It's streaming. I have a whole album of music. It's really ridiculous. Wow. So okay. um, my roommates do, I, I played this song at source books. They have like this big area where everybody gathers. They, they hit like this gong and, and mm-hmm. then I, I played the song and it's about a roommate who meets his other roommate and, and ends up that his roommate's a nudist and the, the roommate who's not a nudist gets very upset and mm-hmm. it has this very big reaction. Eventually that roommate realizes that Stu is who he is. Uh, his roommate Stu's a nudist and they come to a compromise. He wears a thong or underwear. He wears something. Oh, a thong. So, uh, I'm not sure that's much better, Harlan. What is <laughs> <laughs> right. I think they they did come to a compromise. I don't know. If that, okay. I don't know if it was a thong, but anyway, they came to a compromise and they appreciated that there are differences. So anyway, I played this song and the publisher said, they go, ah, man, we really like that song, that roommate stew song, that the naked roommate song was good. They're like, why don't we call it the naked roommate? And it's it's a metaphor for when you encounter 
new and uncomfortable situations, do you attack or do you pause and try to find a connection to work mm-hmm. through difficult situations, not just roommates? Because really, this is not just about roommates. The Naked Roommate and 107 other issues you might run into in college is really about transition and change. They'll use this in community colleges. They'll use it for college readiness programs because there are so many different themes outside of the roommate piece. But it is very catchy. I was like, what on earth is that yeah, story the legs about? on the cover. They did a great job. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild. They did. They did do a good job. So we kind of touched on this before, but your advice really resonates, obviously, with children transitioning into adulthood, into college, and et cetera. But it does really also resonate with more mature folks like myself, because these are life lessons. They're not lessons that you can just apply to one period in your life. They do apply to all aspects of life, no matter what stage and age you're at. So do you have anything planned specifically for your more mature fans? And I'm just asking for a friend. (laughs) (laughs) Is that me? (laughs) Yeah, that'd be you. (laughs) So the book, Win or Learn, uh, we're we're actually, I'm I'm working on it now, and there's going to be a paperback version that's going to have a a risk-taking experiment, kind of a call to action. But I think that's really a wonderful book to provide a framework to look at change because throughout our life, you know, we're navigating change. And when we look at life, uh, we focus mostly on search and selection, but when it comes to change, there's transition, search, selection, transition. And when we tell the story, transition, search, selection, transition, transition, those are the bookends of life. And they really are. We enter the world. It's a transition. We exit the world. It's a transition. And in between there's search, selection and transition. So this idea of really focusing on the transition piece and having a framework to understand what is transition, what are the different aspects of transition, social, emotional, physical, financial, for a student, it's academic, for someone who's outside of that world, professional. Mm -hmm. So those are the five big transitions that we're, we're constantly managing and we're helping those people who we love manage, whether it's a parent who's aging or whether we have a newborn. So right. That that universal theme of how can I look at change and transition, applying this framework, is really where I think everybody can benefit. Um, when when I do these live events, I'll, I'll talk about helping support your student, and then someone will also say, you know, this really applies to my parents who maybe lose a loved one. And just to give your listeners the quick framework, when we go through change, it's the question, what do I want? What makes me uncomfortable? And then it's people, places, patience. So it's what do I want? What makes me uncomfortable? People, places, patience. And as we age, we lose the people we love. And we often are in places where we are dealing with unfamiliar challenges. And oftentimes people become isolated. So it's really interesting is that transition from being uh, in the workplace and having a community, having a place where you're surrounded by people, having a particular role. When we lose that, it's, it's really hard. And Mm -hmm. we don't recognize, okay, well, this is the universal rejection truth. I don't want this to happen, but nothing lasts forever. And then it's where are my places? Who are my people? How long will it take for me to get where I want to go? When we deal with unexpected loss, when we deal with unwanted outcomes, it's that same question of who are my people? Where are my places? How long will it take to get where I want to go? So there, there is something very universal about this. And, and um, I, I, I'm, I, I think that the winter learn book is really a great one. And, you know, right now I'm just so immersed in using the videos and, and social media and the podcast. I want to give people as many ways to consume information in, in the way that is most accessible and most comfortable for them. So um, that's really you know, been the focus, but it's universal and we could all draw and make those connections to our own life. I, I want to get that book. What's it, what's the title of it again, Harlan? So it's win or learn. And it's based on Nelson Mandela's quote. I never lose. I either win or I learn. It, it just is a growth mindset. And, and then it's okay. Well, if I can adopt this, this mindset that will allow me to be okay, no matter what, mm-hmm. now I can start taking a step in the direction I want to go and start practicing how to deal with, with all these different outcomes, expected or unexpected, it's going to be a success. Well, what a gift, what an absolute gift to all of us 
to have that as a, a touchstone that we can refer to in some of the more difficult times in life or just, you know, different times. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today, Harlan. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. If you would like to learn more about Harlan Cohen and his incredible advice, you can find him at www.harlancohen.com or follow him on TikTok at at Help Me Harlan, Instagram at at Harlan Cohen, or on Facebook, YouTube, and Snapchat too. His best sellers can be found at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Sourcebooks. And of course, he does have his brand new podcast. So please do listen in. Thanks again, Harlan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both. I have to thank Harlan for elevating my cool factor. Did you know that, Walker? <laughs> my kids are huge fans and are a little starstruck by the fact that we were speaking with him today. But I have to say his advice is timeless and it really does apply to everybody. None of us can escape change. So true. Change keeps coming. Actually, researchers say we experience a transition roughly every 12 to 18 months. Well, that seems pretty bang on. Like if you think about it, it could be a new job, a relocation, new relationship, something goes on with your kids or even winning the lottery. Well, those seem like all wonderful changes that we would typically celebrate. Absolutely. But any change, even positive change, can be stressful. Mm. Dr. Anna Womack explains that change, whether good or bad, is different from what we are accustomed to, and it can require effort. For example, you get a promotion, but now you have to learn new tasks. You might have to make more alliances right. among your colleagues. You might have to manage people. You know, it's, it's effort. Yeah, I've experienced all those changes we mentioned, except for winning the lottery. Mm. That's one change I'm willing to embrace there still. Oh, you think so, do you, Walker? <laughs> Absolutely. Bring it on. If I don't like it, you know what? I'll just give the money away. Okay, you can give it to me if you want. <laughs> Perfect. But winning the lottery isn't all sunshine and rainbows. <gasps> don't I know it. Actually, a close friend of our families won quite a bit of money about 40 years ago, and it did bring her some heartache. Really? Yeah. People came out of the woodwork asking for a piece of it, and it put a lot of stress on her personal relationships. Well, it's life altering, and I've heard it can really flip things upside down. Yeah, I'm still okay. I'm willing to give it a try. Okay. All right. Me too. <laughs> so the chances of winning the lottery are pretty slim, but we all experience the passage of time, and with time, things change. Right. Take, for example, birthdays. So we mark the big ones, don't we? Like turning 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on. All of these have significance in our society. Oh, yeah, for sure. Parties are planned. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And they are often surprise parties. Yeah, you got it. What is with it, I wonder? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe don't people know. are less willing to acknowledge they've reached these ages. So we have to spring a celebration on them? <laughs> Maybe. I had a pretty quiet 50th as it happened during COVID, but we celebrated when the world opened up on the beaches of Mexico. Do you remember that postcard episode, Walker? I do. You had a blast. Mm -hmm, we did. My 50th was not a big deal either. Either, but I had a pretty great party for my 30th and hmm. a surprise party for my 40th. Oh. It was lovely, but I wasn't super thrilled about the surprise bit. Oh, I thought I was dropping by to pick up something for my brother's place the night before heading to New York City to celebrate my 40th birthday. And sure enough, there were about 30 people waiting for me. I was not dressed for the occasion. Uh-oh. I did have my hairbrush, though. Oh, hallelujah yeah, for which that. Which is one saving grace. Okay, well, Walker's tip of the day. Never leave your house without brushing your hair, just in case you get ambushed with a surprise birthday party. It's not bad advice, you know. Yeah, not bad at all. <laughs> Milestone birthdays really are wonderful transitions, which we are blessed to be healthy enough to celebrate. Yeah. The passage of another year is great, but another decade is even better. You got it. But what about the changes we're faced with, which are not expected? Yeah, those are the changes which psychologists say cause a great amount of stress. They're thrust upon us unexpectedly and are most often entirely out of our control. Right. Some of the harder life events that can trigger enormous stress include the sudden end of a relationship, a poor medical diagnosis for ourselves or somebody yeah. we love. That's a really tough one. An accident. The death of a loved one, of course, or losing your job without notice. According to Professor Sharon B. Merriam, there are four types of life transitions. Okay. First, there's the anticipated transition. And this is a transition that you expect yeah. to happen in the course of an adult life. For instance, getting a job, getting married, having a baby. These are typically somewhat planned, but if your timing is off, that can cause more stress. Okay. Then there's the unanticipated transition. And Ugh. these are things, yeah, you don't expect or plan for, 
like experiencing an accident. And not surprisingly, these types of transitions can be more stressful, but they can lead to more personal growth than an anticipated transition. I thought so too. The third type is a non-event transition. So this is the kind of transition that you expect something to happen, but it doesn't, or it doesn't happen according to the timeline you plan for. So for example, you are planning to have children and you don't have children, oh. or maybe you're, you're expecting that promotion and it goes to somebody else. Okay. And finally, there's the sleeper transition. These are the transitions that you don't know are even happening. They can be positive, like learning a new language over time, or they could be negative too, like losing motivation at work. And I find that idea of this sleeper transition so interesting. Me too. So we know that some life transitions are positive, but can still cause different types of stress. Mm -hmm. One type referred to as eustress helps you feel motivated to be productive. Oh, I think I've had a lot of eustress in my life. (laughs) Me too. But some ongoing stress can negatively affect us emotionally, physically, and mentally. Mm -hmm. Many people seek the shoulder of a friend or the support of a therapist to help them navigate these difficult transitions. Yeah, it's really important to reach out for support and guidance when you need it. Do you know which transitions commonly cause people to seek the help of a therapist? I would think divorce. Well, actually, according to South Cove Counseling, is both marriage and divorce. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So if the marriage is off track, divorce can often follow. And neither of those are a walk in the park. Right. Figuring out how to share your lives with someone is tricky. And so is learning to live our lives on our own, too, once a marriage fails. Mm-hmm. The death of a loved one is one of the most obvious life transitions that brings about stress. Yeah. We have to come to terms with the fact that our loved one is just no longer present. It's one of the hardest, most tough pills to swallow. Absolutely, the worst. And then there is a career change. This transition can often result in imposter syndrome. Oh yeah, that is pretty common. And Mm -hmm. for those of our listeners who do not know what imposter syndrome is, by definition, it's the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. Right. This is common among women, in fact, as they have attained higher level leadership roles since finding their rightful place in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Of course, then, when the career is over, there is then the transition into retirement. Right. People sometimes embrace it but others can really feel a loss, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. The change in routine can be tough. And there's sometimes also a loss of social circles, which is stressful. Yeah, it's so true. And the loss of identity and purpose too, right? Mm. I don't think I'm ever retiring, Walker, just so you know. So I don't think this is a transition I have to worry about. But so many people retire and they just don't know what to do with themselves. Exactly. This was the case for my grandfather. He worked for the same company for roughly 40 years. He retired and then passed away just two years later. Oh, that's heartbreaking. It is. So many people are so focused on work and providing for their family, they don't have the time or inclination to develop any interests or hobbies in their spare time that they can rely on in retirement. Right. And sometimes, even if they do have some hobbies, it's not fulfilling enough. Right. Dr. Daniel B. Kaplan, associate professor at Adelphi University School of Social Work, discusses these transitions, which affect older adults. Mm -hmm. He says a whopping one-third of adults have trouble adapting to things like less income and the different social roles they now fill when they enter retirement. He also points out that not everyone retires by choice either which is very important to recognize. Some are forced into retirement because of health problems or because they've lost their job. Yeah, that happens a lot. And, you know, we don't necessarily talk about that. Mm -hmm. People are downsized out of the roles or age out. I can only imagine how difficult this can be. Yeah, for sure. We see a very common life transition all the time, though, don't we, Walker, you and I? Oh, we do. We're in the business of helping people relocate, which is so tough, even Mm -hmm. if it's for a happy reason. Yeah. The more difficult transitions, though, involve family breakups from death or divorce, downsizing as your nest empties there of kids, Mm -hmm. or having to move into assisted living due to health and wellness changes, right? Right. The less control or agency someone has over their reasons for moving, the more stressful the experience. And do you want to know something? Men don't tend to respond as well to change. I've heard that. Yeah, I think I've witnessed it. Daniel Kaplan says the death of a spouse affects men and women differently. In the two years after the death of a wife, the mortality rate in men tends to increase, especially if the wife's death was unexpected. Wow. 
For women who lose a husband, data are less clear, but generally do not indicate an increased mortality rate. I follow this actor, actually, Richard E. Grant on Instagram. Have you heard of him? I have. Yeah. He has recently been sharing his very honest and very painful portrayal of a man trying to find his footing after the loss of his beloved wife. And I think it might provide some comfort to those who are perhaps going through the same thing. So I'm going to pop his handle in the show notes. That would be great. You know, the poor guys. I wonder what the reason might be for this difference. Mm -hmm. Perhaps because women maybe have traditionally taken on more of a caregiving role in the home. Maybe. Kaplan also states that older folks are less likely to seek mental health help, which exacerbates the stress. And that's something I think we really need to point out. A therapist can really help smooth over some of life's difficult transitions, no matter what your age. Right. Even if it's an illness that you're struggling with, a therapist can help you work through your feelings and anxiety about all the uncertainty and fear that being sick can bring up. Yeah, yeah. That fear of the unknown can really trigger a downward spiral of negative thinking. It's an endless chain of what ifs. Mm. When I had my last child, I developed a heart issue and I was paralyzed with fear. But it was a therapist that really helped me face it and live more comfortably with my anxiety. It didn't go away, yeah. but I was able to, to adapt. And it's hard enough being a parent. Mm -hmm. It can put stress on a marriage too if you and your partner are not on the same page, right? Absolutely. And I would think that blended families and becoming a parental figure in your partner's kids' lives might even be the most stressful for the parents and for the kids. Yeah, I've heard that. Another good reason to seek counseling support. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And then that stress morphs once again when parents become empty nesters. Personally, when my daughter left for university last year, I found that the house was a lot quieter than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And that was a change that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say was difficult, but it was very emotional. Yeah, I remember putting out one less placemat when my eldest left home and it just sent me into like fits of tears. And soon we're not going to have any kids at home and I'm sure we're going to feel it. But Truthfully, my hubby and I are also looking forward to new adventures too. Regardless, there's no doubt going to be stress. For now, I'm just going to bury my head in the sand. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ignorance is bliss. I will enjoy the 14 months I have left before we become empty nesters. Oh my gosh, 14 months. I know, I know. But if you think about it, Walker, it's kind of bizarre that you share your whole life with these little human beings. You get used to having them around day in and day out. And then one day they just get up and leave. Very bizarre. Isn't it? But it's a good transition though. We've done well if they have the confidence and wherewithal to get out there and make their own way, don't you think? It might be a little tricky getting used to though. Tricky for sure. Have you checked out Tamsin Fidel's Instagram page there? No, no. Yeah, she's a public figure, journalist, author, and menopause and midlife advocate. Oh. She's a great follow for guidance through midlife transitions. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I do follow quite a few women as I'm going through that marvelous change myself, as you know, (laughs) but I haven't yet cottoned on to her. So I'm going to seek her out and we'll, we'll attach her link in the show notes too. Whatever resources we can find to help us navigate the ever-changing flow of life. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the quote by Heraclitus. No man ever steps into the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. To put it simply there, everything is constantly changing. Yeah, it just can't be avoided. But we can really learn from leaders in change and transition like Harlan and seek counsel and therapy when we need it to help us prepare to navigate these moments when they inevitably happen. Right. Yes. Dr. Anna Womack, who we referred to earlier in this episode, has created a set of tips to help us cope with transitions. Hmm. Would you like to hear them? You know I would. Okay. Well, just as you said, if you can prepare, then prepare. Okay. Make a plan to help you navigate the transition. At minimum, it will put you in a good place mentally going forward. Okay. Be prepared, just like the Boy Scouts say. Can't hurt. Okay. Also, make sure you're being reasonable with your expectations. Don't expect the transition to be easy peasy if you know in your heart it's very likely going to be hard. Right. Having inflated expectations often leads to disappointment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when your expectations are exceeded, it's a happy surprise, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Womack also recommends that we establish a routine. It's important to have a morning and evening routine. Regular sleeping and eating, walking and meditating are all things that you might want to consider in your routine. Okay. This is really good advice. A morning routine has really helped me 
with some very difficult times in my life, I have to say. What's your morning routine, Harris? Because I have no routine. Okay. So I've got room for improvement okay. here. You might have a nighttime routine. As you know, I get up with the birds. So I'm up very early. I have a little lemon water. I light a candle. I set my intentions for the day. So it's putting myself in a good headspace. Then I try to meditate for 10 minutes. It doesn't always happen, but I try. And then I settle in to do my Wordle and French practice on Duolingo. So it's really predictable, it's quick, and it just sets the right tone for me for the day. Wow, that sounds very peaceful. Mm -hmm. And it might help with the next tip from Dr. Wobach. Okay. She says, watch yourself talk. Right. Make sure that the way you speak to yourself is helpful and not damaging. Right. She says, a great healthy approach in transitional times is to remind yourself of all the times you managed transitions successfully in the past, right? We forget those moments. Yeah, we do. And we believe what we tell ourselves. We have to keep that internal dialogue positive. And she also says that small goals are key. Baby steps. Exactly. Mm. All those baby steps add up. Just take a small step in a positive direction, and that will help you navigate the change. And of course, connection is key. Don't isolate yourself. Reach out. Ask for help. Yeah, don't suffer in silence. Right. Keep up those connections you have with family and friends. These are lonely times, and transitions can sometimes be isolating. Mm -hmm. Finally, Dr. Womack says, just be kind to yourself. Nice. She says, the reality is that you aren't always going to navigate life transitions perfectly. Mm -hmm. Practice self-compassion. It's okay to feel overwhelmed or stressed when navigating a change in life. Say to yourself, I'm just going to do the best I can in this moment. I love it. Bruce Feiler, New York Times bestselling author, wrote a guidebook for navigating life transitions and change. It's called Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. Have you read it? No. Yeah. Feiler's Life Story Project recorded life story interviews of 225 people across the United States. What he did is he coded the stories and looked for patterns. Wow, that sounds interesting. Yeah, in an interview for Forbes, he said, we go through three dozen life transitions in our life, one every 12 to 18 months. Okay. It's more than people see a dentist. Yes, that's very true. (laughs) These disruptors, as he calls them, can be negative or positive. Okay. Filer says that every now and then, though, these disruptors rise to the level of what he refers to as a life quake. Oh, a massive source of change that lasts for years. Oh, wow. This can happen three to five times in our lifetime. So it seems that we spend half our life in an unsettled state. Wow, half our lives? Yeah, crazy. Holy cow. Right. He says we're comparing ourselves to an ideal linear life where predictable life events just unfold one after the other. And that doesn't exist. No, it really doesn't. So that sounds counterproductive. Exactly. Ultimately, Filer believes that in a world where transitions are becoming more plentiful, it's also more important that we master the skills to manage them. Mm -hmm. As he notes in his TED Talk, we all control the story we tell about ourselves. So we need to reimagine life transitions, not as miserable times, but rather healing times Hmm. that take the wounded parts of our lives and begin to repair them. Wow. His TED Talk is fascinating. I recommend anybody listen to it. We'll include the link in our show notes. Okay, that's great, Walker. I actually have a predictable, anticipated transition for you right now. What's that, Harris? This episode has come to an end. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you would rate and review our show. It helps us grow and expand our reach. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can also say hi to us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you.